Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Australia at Home webcast. Uh, my name is Anton Enos. Could we start by just pausing for a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodian, custodians of the land on which we are variously meeting today? We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging of the many Aboriginal nations across our continent. My name is Anton Enos, and my day job, when I'm not growing a beard, is in the SBS World News newsroom. It's um, a small newsroom and one that does, I think, quite significant work and which I've been very, very honored and privileged to be associated with for a very long time. Australian Home is designed to be a meeting place for civil society in Australia to support one another, cheer one another on and share ideas. It's a project of essential the Guardian, the Centre for Australian Progress, Principal Co and Community Council for Australia and ACF. Um, in the spirit of this year's National Reconciliation Week theme, In This Together, the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, FECA, is partnering with Australia at Home and SBS to hold a conversation around what reconciliation looks like between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and multicultural communities around Australia. We're going to be talking about a range of issues around that broad theme. And we have three very exciting panelists joining us here today who are immersed in this subject. Could I welcome first uh, Senator Patrick Dodson, hailing from Broome and representing the state of Western Australia in the Senate since 2016. He's been deeply involved in community and public life as a politician, an academic, and a Roman Catholic priest. He is the Shadow Assistant Minister for Reconciliation and for Constitutional Recognition of Indigenous Australians. Karen Mundine is CEO of Reconciliation Australia and hails from Northern New South Wales as a member of the Bundjalung Nation. She has more than two decades experience in public life having participated in events around Corroboree 2000, Centenary of Federation, the Apology, and the Reconciliation Convention of 1997. Shanur Shah, like me, is a migrant Australian hailing from Pakistan in her case. She is a policy and project officer for FECA, and her areas of focus are gender security, including the prevention of violence against women, and research and policy development in a more general sense in the NGO sector. She was instrumental in launching FECA's inaugural Reconciliation Action Plan, and more recently, a resource titled Encouraging Engagement, a guide for multicultural organizations to engage in reconciliation. So welcome to all of you. We'll be talking about race relations in general, hopefully touch on a range of other things, including the Uluru Statement, this new campaign called From the Heart, funding implications under the pandemic, and most importantly, how we can all maintain the respect and dignity that has to be at the core of this conversation and process. So because our time is fairly limited, I'm going to launch straight into some questions. And we will also take some questions from those of you who are uh, tuned in via Zoom. Um, there's a process by which you can lodge some questions and I will then call on you directly if uh, we grab one of your questions off the, um, the platform. So Karen, if I could start with you, the most topical thing, of course, happening in the world this week, um, from our point of view, is this race relations in the US that literally and figuratively up in flames um, we live in a globalized world where, of course, we're all directly affected by these things. Um, so does it make us pause and say, uh, you know, where are we in Australia in this process? We've got a lot of obstacles and problems in our uh, situation. But can we say that we've actually achieved a great deal up to this point? Is that a fair comment, Karen? Look, I think the things that are happening and playing out in the, the United States are troubling times and it's, it's, it's quite concerning, I have to say. Um, 
equally when I think about here in Australia, we see that the, the rates and the experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continuing to experience racism. And in fact, um, uh, lots of different people from different multicultural and diverse multicultural backgrounds um, continuing to experience racism. So to that extent, um, this is something that we've still yet to, to grapple with, that we've still yet to um, uh, move beyond or, or get through. Um, for me, I think it's, it's frustrating that we haven't been able to see those kind of rates or things come down. Um, I think in our latest survey, from our reconciliation barometer, I think it still sits at about 30%, one in three Aboriginal and Strong people experiencing racism. And I know that sits um, very similarly across uh, other types of surveys of this kind. Um, but I guess what's more of that though, and I guess what's playing out in the US is, it's the systemic issues. And it's how do we address the systemic uh, racism and the institutionalized um, discrimination that continues to happen and, and for us at Reconciliation Australia that's sort of where our focus is. Uh, we try to address that through things like reconciliation action plans. Uh, we try to address that by working with companies, with organisations uh, to really get to the heart of actually how do we change the institutions that should be upholding uh, these ideas of reconciliation. Um, it's slow, we are making progress though, um, but certainly I would like to see it happening at a, a far greater pace. Well, we've certainly seen the, the mayor of uh, New York City, Bill de Blasio, acknowledging the structural and systemic racism that is a huge factor in what we see, this horrifying sight we see uh, going across many states in the United States. Uh, Patrick, if I could turn to you, um, what do you take away from what we're seeing there and how it can help us not go down to that, that sort of scale of events? Uh, it's, it's, it's very troubling uh, that um, we see yet again uh, an outpouring of public uh, sentiment against an injustice that's clearly been uh, perpetrated on a black man. It's, um, it's, it's, you, you often think whether there is any solution here. Because you go back to the days of slavery and the denial of people's rights uh, the philosophical and religious teachings that underpin the supremacy of uh, the, the uh, people who believe that they were superior to all others. Um, so there are these embedded deeper um, teachings or learnings or indoctrinations that um, are so part of the psyche of uh, the diversity of our nations that it's very hard to see where we'll get uh, relief. There'll be temporary relief, no doubt. The, the fellow who's charged will be brought to, to court and, and charged. Uh, we only recently in Australia have charged a police officer at Unamu, as you know, for the uh, death of an Aboriginal man there. That's yet to go to trial. Uh, but that's one of the few occasions where a police officer has been charged uh, in this, where someone's been in custody, basically, uh, and where they've, they've been shot in this case. So I, I think it's, there, there are twofold things. There's perceptions that we have of each other uh, where we don't handle difference very well, and that's on all sides. Uh, there's the um, ignorance that we have of other peoples, uh, our perceptions of them, uh, we're too prone to judge uh, others uh, rather than look at our own uh, contribution, I suppose, to uh, some of the predicaments. Um, I'm, I'm dismayed by the high levels of out-of-care home, for instance, of Aboriginal young kids. Now, you can have draconian institutional methods and laws that go to responding to those situations, but you then got to look at the social settings of the families from which these children are coming and how much support is given to them in order for them to carry their responsibilities. And, and so there's, there's a two-way street here somewhere and we can't solve it by simply focusing on one side of the street. Uh, and in, in most cases, our emotions get terribly tied 
uh, when we see um, uh, obvious injustice and, and it affects people of, of all colours. Okay, we obviously perceptions, complexity, you, you went into a bit there. Um, and having the sense of a two way conversation, I know from my own experience that FECA has been instrumental in making rela race relations in this country a constructive and dignified conversation. I've seen this demonstrated over the years. Uh, if I could turn to Shano Shav, the year uh, of FECA, um, you've got some experience in this area. I mean, how do you take that mindset of keeping it constructive and dignified? and then applying it to finding a way that migrant communities, ethnic minority communities, non-Indigenous communities can be helpful and supportive to this process of reconciliation. Thank you, Anton. Um, I think the first, uh, the first way we can do that is to make sure that we're listening to Indigenous voices first, um, even with my work at FECA, we make sure before we put out statements or um, reports or guides or anything that we do get in touch with Reconciliation Australia and our other Indigenous stakeholders to ensure that whatever we are saying is also reflecting their message. Um, the second uh, way we can address this, and I know this might be difficult for people who are more directly affected by racism, is to make sure that we allow people to have that conversation in a safe space. So I'm really hoping today this will, you know, be a really engaging and um, positive platform for people to have their questions answered. I know we have a lot of conversations every year around Australia Day and even when we hear things about what's happening in the US, um, you know, we think that this doesn't happen here or discrimination against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people stopped a long time ago. But this is something that's current and the only way we're going to learn about it and move forward from it is um, to be able to listen to our uh, elders first. And just to flip that same sentiment around, uh, Karen, it seems like there is an opportunity here <laughs> for a high profile event such as Reconciliation Week to draw in especially younger members of uh, communi other, other communities, ethnic minority communities into this cause, what kind of message uh, would you like to share with migrant Australians, newer Australians who may not know much about indigenous culture or how to engage with it? Yeah, so National Reconciliation Week is meant to be that week to, to bring people together and particularly, um, as Shinor says, to kind of create those safe spaces for us to start having conversations, um, to ask those questions that we sometimes don't get the opportunities to. Um, and also um, to highlight, I guess, uh, not just how far we still have to go in this road to reconciliation, but actually some of the milestones and, and successes that we've had along the way. Um, I would say to um, culturally diverse, well, people coming from culturally diverse backgrounds is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are uh, a diverse people ourselves and there is much to learn about who we are and the contributions um, that we have made and continue to make within the society. Um, and just like all Australians, all Australians um, have a role to play in this and that includes uh, migrant and refugee communities um, and I think there is much that we can also learn from each other. Um, we have some shared experiences, uh, we are affected and impacted in lots of uh, similar ways and I think uh, creating more empathy between us uh, and understanding those, those backgrounds and stories kind of create opportunities for us to move forward together. Okay we're going to take some questions from the floor as well so um, I'll pick out a couple from the, those coming in on the feed. Emma Kate Rose, if you could um, perhaps uh, unmute your uh, link, we'll get to you in a moment. But while you're doing that, let me ask uh, Senator Dodson. Um, I think one of the key things that I'm seeing from the situation in the US is that the, the top end of the political leadership is so fractured. There's a, it seems like warfare at that top uh, end of the leadership. Um, that is part, fundamentally part of the problem and that, that those intense emotions are being fanned by that. What is your sense of how things are in Canberra? Is there a, an appetite for moving reconciliation forward in a, in a real sense, not just ticking boxes? 
Uh, look, I, I, uh, I don't think there is, quite frankly. I, um, I think um, there's this denial of the truth of the position of the First Nations in this country. Uh, there's a denial that the lands were stolen from the Aboriginal people and that there needs to be an agreed outcome to settle that matter. And that's either a treaty or some other matter, a Makarata. So there's, there's no appetite for disturbing the status quo. And we saw that clearly when the Uluru Statement came forward and the call for a voice uh, to the parliament uh, was sought by the Aboriginal people to help the governments shape policies and legislation that are going to affect the Aboriginal people in a way that's acceptable and less adverse to their interests. And when that was put, it was rejected as if it was some kind of separate parliament. Now, that's a, a, a very mischievous response to the uh, historical uh, theft of the Aboriginal people's lands and the denial of their inherent rights. And we've seen gradually over the years in Australia some uh, rectification of this through the High Court in Marbo, in Wick, um, through the Bringing Them Home report, uh, through the um, recognition that there's, a, that there's a spiritual component as well. It's not just the physical loss of the lands, but because the connection of Aboriginal peoples to their lands has a deeply spiritual component, we've seen in the Timber Creek High Court judgment that there is a compensation element now that has to be also dealt with. So there's a complexity here in a political sense that the government has to face up to and is unwilling to do so with the representatives of the First Nations. So people of other cultures, as, as Australians, have to understand we've got to settle the arguments we've got with the British heritage of Australia and the colonial settlement issues of Australia. And then I think we've got to question the nature of the polity that we want to have, and that's where the dialogue with First Nations and multicultural communities have to take place as well so that the expression of our complete independence from the monarchy of England can find an expression that's compatible with the wishes of all Australians, rather than the one that we've all been saddled up with that's come from England. Okay, I want to get back to that uh, response to the Uluru statement in a moment, but let's take the question from Emma Kate Rose. Uh, Emma, I think you're with us uh, now. You had a question about terminology. Yes, Anton, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've had a little bit to do, and hello from Yagara country in Brisbane. Um, I've had a little bit to do with Auntie Lilla Watson here in Brisbane, and she often says that reconciliation is the wrong word to be using and suggested that it should be conciliation because we need to start first from first principles of mediation between settlers and First Nations before we can come to reconciliation, which is more about um, a compromise or reaching a compatible view of each other. I'm wondering what the panel um, feels about the terminology around reconciliation and why it can be problematic. I guess I'll, I'll jump in as, as the CEO of Reconciliation Australia. Um, it's not something that we're um, uh, that we haven't heard before. Uh, we know that the word reconciliation is a contested word. Um, but this is why we came up with our five dimensions of reconciliation to really unpack what we mean by that. And I can't agree more that um, that those first steps, that truth telling piece is so fundamental um, to how we think about what reconciliation, the process of reconciliation looks like. Uh, but also, how do we build really strong foundations for a better relationship. And at the end of the day, it really is about that relationship between First Nations of this country and other Australians. Um, so how do we build those uh, building blocks? How do we build solid foundations that are built on truth, that does um, require strength and courage on our parts to dream up and think of different ways of addressing these inherent problems that we continue to face after 200 
plus years. So um, uh, Annie Lilla is not the only auntie that's, that's had this conversation with me many times, um, but for me, it's more important that we understand what sits under it. Um, and those five dimensions, as I said, it is about race relations. It is about institutional integrity. Uh, it is about the equality and equity as First Nations people. Uh, it's also about the uh, historical acceptance, which is that truth telling piece. And then of course, um, how do we become a unified nation? So Senator Dodson, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that before I move on. Oh, look, it's the words are, are complex. The, uh, uh, we could argue about the words all day. Um, the truth of the matter is that the British came to Australia and usurped this land from the First Nations peoples, despite instructions from the colonial secretary to take it with the consent of the First Nations. And so we have, a, we have a problem of how is this justified? And of course, we could go back to the 1400s to Rome when the papal edicts pronounced the doctrine of discovery and the different ways imperial nations could take uh, indigenous people's lands. And of course, this debate springs out of that. And what we're trying to deal with is the legacy of the usurping of these lands, either by way of conquest, we've never ceded them, we've never gone into a treaty. So First Nations people have said, you ought to sit down and have a, a proper discussion. Now, whether you call that reconciliation, conciliation, uh, is, is in one's way you call it Makarata. The process to have the discussion is what we haven't yet agreed upon. And that's the challenge we have at the moment. And the outcome is whether we have recognition as sovereign peoples within the sovereignty of Australia, or whether we, we've got to remain as one kind of politically united group of people. And that's just true for, for the multicultural communities, as it is for the British, and as it is for the First Nations. So ultimately, there's a challenge for all of us to recognise the distinctiveness we bring to the table here and the legacy issues and how do we resolve those in a respectful manner that gives each of us pride, comfort and, and a capacity to enjoy the human and political rights that we know are embedded in United Nations conventions and declarations, etc. So there's a complexity to this. It's the substance of what we want to deal with at the end of the day that we have to focus on and what's the outcome we're trying to achieve uh, and, the, and the justice we're trying to ensure takes place for the original injustices uh, that go not only with the dispossession of First Nations, but then the perpetration of a range of policies and dispossession actions that have uh, taken place right up to the present day. Well, that segues neatly into the question I was going to ask Karen next, and that is, um, you talk about building blocks there, uh, you know, high profile event like Reconciliation Week. Um, we ask these questions every year. You work throughout the year to try and resolve them. How do you measure whether we're making progress or not? I mean, there's a danger that we could just be rearranging the furniture, not making real progress what are the markers you are looking for to see that see that progress yeah it's a it's a really good question Anton um and there is that danger we do that when we when we look at just our barometer and those kind of um measures of those attitudes and and we look at the as Senator Dodson already mentioned the rising rates of children out of home care um, increasing rates of incarceration um, we do tend to be more looking at the positive from an, a reconciliation point of view, from an RA point of view, um, not because we're Pollyannas, but because we have to, to really, uh, we want to encourage where there is progress and where we're seeing positivity happening. Um, it is a large job. It is a large scale thing. Uh, we're coming up to our 20th anniversary. 
um, but we're also unpacking 200 plus years of these legacies. Um, we do need to drill down is, is how is this starting to play out in our communities? And that's one of the things and areas that we look at quite closely. Um, how is it being felt? How is it being uh, enacted in the day-to-day -day lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? How do we get our institutions to be better accountable for uh, these kind of uh, for progressing reconciliation and, and how do we see progress there? As I said before, it, it is slow and I do wish that the pace was happening at a much faster um, pace. I think leadership absolutely plays a big role in this. We know we see action when leaders uh, drive that action. Uh, but equally, we have weeks like this because it is also, also about the people. We, we live in a, a social democratic society. And um, as we saw 20 years ago with a quarter of a million people walking across the, the Sydney Harbour Bridge in support of reconciliation, um, it can also be a people's movement. And, and as people, as citizens, uh, we have a right to be demanding more of our politicians, of our policymakers, uh, of our leaders. We're going to take a question from Rosemary Draper Bolton Clark. If you could unmute your microphone, but while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Shanur um, to comment on this concept that I think we accept as a starting point as far as ethnic minority communities are concerned that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities do have a special place in our nation on account of being the First Nations. So, how does FECA? approach this is quite a fundamental difference isn't it how does FECA approach this key difference um so the way we uh, approach it is to ensure that the outcome of that conversation or um you know of projects like this still remains to overcome racism um i think just the conversation and the way we approach things change slightly because while we ha uh, have shared experiences with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, we also face those barriers of um, access to things like education, healthcare, employment, government services. Um, we need to realize that these barriers and the people who were affected by these barriers and policies first were our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Migrants who've come you know, since then, we also face those same issues, but um, there's no way for FECA to do its advocacy work effectively until we recognize who was affected by these policies first um, and the fact that we need to work with them together if we are um, to advocate for the removal um, of these uh, policies and barriers as well. I hope that's a, I hope I've covered the second part of your question there as well. Okay. Um we spoke a little bit earlier, Patrick, about uh, the appetite for change in Canberra. Um, we do have this unique situation that we have an Aboriginal minister in the Aboriginal portfolio. There's an Aboriginal shadow minister in Linda Burney and, of course, yourself. Uh, this surely must generate a bit of momentum for change. But what do you think, need, in addition to that, needs to happen at the, at the Canberra leadership level? Oh, look, these things are done at the, at the top a long way from where I sit, Anton. Uh, this is really in the, in the hands of the Prime Minister. Uh, he has uh, the capacity to give direction to the ship. And uh, if he uh, puts up a signal that uh, supports his minister uh, to go down the track of a referendum or to bring about the legislative... Uh, enactment of a voice to the parliament, uh, then it'll be done. Uh, at the moment, he's, uh, he, uh, I'm not sure how much he's learned from the bushfires and the COVID virus uh, impacts. Uh, he's seemingly wanting to establish dialogues with diverse sections of the society, uh, like trade unions that he hasn't traditionally had much interest in, except to bash up. Uh, so, uh, if he sincerely wants to move our nation forward and become more unified, then he would sit down with, with the Labor Party, which he hasn't done to this stage, and work out a way to bring our nation forward around the question of recognition in the Constitution and for the legislation to set up the, uh, uh, the voice to the Parliament. They're not, they're not that hard to do. 
with the proper leadership. And there's not a big ask here. All people are asking for is that uh, there be a power in the constitution to set up a voice, that it would have no uh, other capacity. It would be subject to the parliament legislating it into existence. And of course it re would remain subject to the parliament as to what its powers, functions and operations would be. That's not a complicated thing. That's what happens in parliament every day of the week. So this isn't the big ask. It is embedded in the racist psyche of the nation that we don't move forward here. Now, the Prime Minister has a great opportunity here to actually show leadership around this point, and he would get great acclaim, I think, from all the various parties. Maybe one might not support him, but he would get acclaim from all the rest of us if he were to go down that track with his First Nations Minister. Okay, let's, uh, there's some issues arising out of what you just said there, but let's uh, go to Rosemary, who's been waiting to put a question about how non-Indigenous Australians can find better engagement with Indigenous culture. Rosemary, what, what's your question? Oh, hello, um, everyone. Um, I work in the aged care industry, um, and I come across um, staff members and clients and just people in my personal life, so younger people as well, who seem to have absolutely no idea about um, issues facing Aboriginal people in Australia. In fact, a, a question I often get asked is, are there still Aboriginal people in Australia? So I think sometimes we forget the level of um, knowledge when we work in the area, that there are a whole lot of people out there who just don't know anything. So I suppose my question is, I've suggested things like watching NITV, um, those sorts of things, but I'm just wondering what else we can do to introduce people um, who are especially like older migrants um, who want to know more about Reconciliation Week, about you know, all the issues that we've been talking about today. Karen. Yeah, Rosemary, um, thanks for your question. And I think uh, NITV is a great starting point. There's been, particularly this week, some fantastic programming going across not just NITV, but SBS more broadly. Uh, I have to say the ABC as well. Um, and also particularly SBS who have started to do things uh, in languages as well. So again, it's an easy entry point into learning some of that history. One of the things I've discovered uh, this year with uh, the situations that we found ourselves in and, and increasingly doing more of these digital and virtual events rather than physical events is um, it's actually opened up a, a whole a range of different activities to get engaged in uh, because people can log on and they can do that from anywhere. They don't have to leave the comfort of their home. Um, so watching uh, some great films out there, some really interesting documentaries. Um, there are lots of podcasts. There's all sorts of different levels of engaging around this. Um, as I said before, we try to look at this institutionally as well. So thinking about workplaces and getting workplaces to address uh, that history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, but also more um, the tougher end, if you like, is, is confronting and talking about our relationships and, and how we relate to each other, which includes uh, uh, racism, uh, it, it includes those prejudices and discriminations that sits behind, you know, in that unconscious bias space. Uh, so I think there are lots of different ways. I guess it's always difficult when there are so many things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day just life basis. It's finding the time, it's finding um, the opportunities. But again, I'd like to think that weeks like National Reconciliation Week, like NAIDOP Week, um, these are opportunities to highlight that there is this wealth of information out there. Uh, and as I said, our public broadcasters are doing an amazing job in, in making that stuff accessible. Thanks very much. I'll take that as a compliment, Karen. <laughs> I'm going to stay with you. Um, I saw a story in the, in the news in this past week. Um, it's a kind of nuts and bolts story about ABSEC, the uh, peak body looking after family welfare in the Aboriginal communities in New South Wales, having to end a range of uh, support services due to funding changes. Um, and then you see a story like the destruction of the rock art that's dating back tens of thousands of years in WA. Give us a sense how, of how this kind of, sort of nuts and bolts thing 
impact on the broader concept of reconciliation? Yeah, look, both of those stories, uh, I have to say, broke my heart. Um, there's no other way to put it. Um, they, uh, it's really difficult when you know, particularly in that ABSEC um, example, they're doing some great, amazing work that is making a difference. Uh, and to see that being cut short because of funding uh, becomes extremely difficult as we kind of, uh, we've already talked about, you know, we're not necessarily seeing the progress across these areas that we would like. Um, what we try and do, as I said before, with our reconciliation action plans is we continue to try and chip away. Uh, it is about really uh, pushing those institutions and those organisations. So whether it's because of their funding decisions because, or whether it's because of uh, other decisions, business decisions that they make to really get them to fundamentally think about what does reconciliation mean to them and how does that then play out in a really practical way in terms of the decisions that they're making. Um, we don't always get it right, um, and a lot of our organisations don't get it right, but we still want to continue to work with them. It's difficult, um, but all relationships have uh, uh, difficult conversations and we'll continue to have those difficult conversations that lead to action um, and change actions, change perceptions. Uh, so hopefully that these things don't continue to happen in the future. Shano, if I could uh, throw a question at you. We know that when we're dealing with FECA issues, they're pretty complex and complicated in their own sense. There's a range of political views, some very conservative, some very religious, for instance, as we saw in the marriage equality debate. Um, do you sometimes encounter the view within migrant communities that, do you know what, our situation is complicated enough. We don't need to get involved in something that we don't really understand. Uh, and how do you address that kind of view? Um, yeah, I just want to start by addressing that I don't think it comes from a place of indifference. I think it's more so, uh, you know, migrants who are especially newer to Australia, we find in our consultations and things that they are very grateful to be here. They want to be that model citizen. They want to pay their taxes, have a job. Um, what they don't want to be doing is rocking the boat and uh, criticizing the government and, you know, protesting and complaining. Um, however, this doesn't absolve us of our responsibility to engage in reconciliation. Um, with FECA specifically, we were one of the first organizations to sign the accord with the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. That was back in 2012. In 2014, we worked with Reconciliation Australia to launch a dedicated issue of our magazine titled Our Diverse Mob. Um, and then last year, of course, we launched our Reconciliation Action Plan. Um, what's been really fantastic and encouraging is that from our members and from the people in the community we speak to, we haven't really gotten the sense that um, we shouldn't be uh, in this space and we shouldn't be raising our voices. If anything, we've actually gotten um, feedback that we should be doing more and our processes should be a lot more consultative. Um, we should be uh, including and uplifting uh, Indigenous voices um, uh, to be even louder and amplifying them. Um, from a personal level though, I think that when we take into account that uh, migrants and people who were not born in Australia make up almost 30% of the population, whereas our um, in, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up between 4 to 5%, depending on which um, sources we look at. It is a moral obligation we have uh, to stand up and, um, again, just amplify these voices. It would be irresponsible for us to, you know, sit back and watch these people face the exact same barriers as us and not um, be able to raise our voice and support that. Okay, uh, that's a very good sentiment. I just want to take you back to uh, something that uh, Karen mentioned uh, a little while back. Um, an amazing event that happened in the year 2000, that walk for reconciliation across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, Linda Burney, of course, the Shadow Minister was quite involved in that uh, event. I saw her quoted this week as saying it was one of the, quote, one of the most remarkable days of my life. And I would second that. It was uh, SBS did live coverage of that event. Uh, big challenge for a very small network at the time. I was a roving reporter on the bridge on that day. And it really was 
an exceptional day. I mean, I, I do remember the outpouring of public support and goodwill. It was absolutely incredible. Um, Karen, it's been 20 years since that momentous uh, event happened. It's, it's hard to believe that it has been 20 years. Um, and my, my regret now is that, is there a sense that we as a nation missed an opportunity in those heady days with all of that great goodwill of nailing down reconciliation as a done deal then? I think um, thinking of reconciliation as a deal, I think is prob problematic for us. Uh, we talk about reconciliation as a journey and it is a journey that we are still on and will still be on for some time yet. Definitely there was a lot of aspiration and hope that came out of that day. And I was working with um, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation back then at the time. So like you, I was running around uh, on the bridge and, and then later in Darling Harbour. Um, it had it held such promise. And I guess Reconciliation Australia grew out of um, that event or that, that day and that the work of the council. Um, and it has been uh, the legacy that we inherited of how do we turn that aspiration, that goodwill into actions and positive outcomes. Um, what we've seen in the, the intervening years, I guess, is um, we have seen the movement. We, one of the big sort of points of that day itself in that year was actually a push for the government to say sorry. Uh, we have now seen that. We have worked very closely with Stolen Generations uh, and now the Healing Foundation to, to work through what does healing look like for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and how do we apply that in a broader sense um, to our broader Australian community. Uh, we have seen small wins. We have uh, more than 1,100 organisations with reconciliation action plans. So again, addressing their institutional response to these things. Um, it is challenging because I think everyone had such high expectations of the day. Uh, but as I said, we're unpacking 200 plus years of all of this. And as Senator Dodson has said, um, these attitudes and, and um, uh, actually last longer and, and go deeper than that. So until we can kind of address the fundamentals of what the, the starting point of that relationship is and sitting down together to move forward on it, um, uh, we still have a road to go. And just to pick up, Karen, on something that Patrick was saying um, a moment ago about the Uluru statement, uh, when we think back three years to when that statement was drawn up, such an earnest, fundamental, emotion-packed assertion of who we are and can be as a nation, but the response from the government at the time was just to cut it down immediately, saying it's absolutely not going to happen. So give us a sense of how that feels then and now, that sort of that sense of it's just not going to happen and how we move on from that kind of setback. So I guess Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are not um, strange, well, they're not strangers to setbacks. Uh, we continue to be here. Um, we continue to push ahead. What we saw, um, and I agree, the, the sentiments that were put forward in the Uluru Statement were very reasonable um, in what was being asked. And it was absolutely shocking that they were cut down in such a dismissive way at the time. I guess, though, the conversation hasn't completely um, uh, gone away. Uh, it's continuing to happen. There are some processes. Um, and what we had saw was that the support from the general community remained to be there. And uh, I think all of us are waiting for that next step. But as Patrick also said, it is around leadership. It is about that willingness to support these uh, very simple and I would say humble uh, requests of how do we build a better relationship. We're going to take a question from Abram Bradfield in a moment. So Abram, if you could unmute your mic. Let me just ask Patrick a question while we're doing that. Um, we have seen in this past week the launch of From the Heart, which of course is a phrase taken from the Uluru Statement, to breathe new life into constitutional recognition and this uh, voice to Parliament. We've also seen the Prime Minister and the, the Minister uh, promising a referendum sometime in 2021, quite a few caveats surrounding that. Um, there seems, Patrick, to be quite a lot of wriggle room with the potential that the whole thing actually just goes nowhere. Well, that, that's certainly, um, until you see the detail of these things, Anton, 
in the political realm, it's, um, it has the potential to just drop off uh, the agenda. Um, I, you've got to be decisive here. You, 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 I think there's, there's got to be a serious commitment saying we are going to do this. Not that we're going to further look at it or play around with it or poke it with a stick or something, see whether it's got life. There's been sufficient dialogue, discussion, and aspiration around the, around this matter now. I, I was on a parliamentary uh, joint house committee with uh, uh, Julian Lissa. Uh, we looked at uh, this question when it got kicked off the political agenda, and we were able to keep it alive, at least in the parliamentary precinct, uh, which has now given it uh, the opportunity to come back into the the, per the people space. And I would hope that we don't have to have the argy-bargy uh, to re-establish the credibility of the call. The, the Uluru Statement also has there a clear um, invitation for people of Australia, all people of Australia, to understand the the um, the torment of people's powerlessness, to, to being powerless in your own country. Now, this must resonate with people who've migrated here, coming out of the tyranny or the awfulness of the political circumstances, social circumstances of their own nations or the nations that they were born into, and then to such an extent to want to come here. Now, the First Nations people are saying that tyranny that you've escaped from is a tyranny that we've been living under for the last 200 years. And it's time for this to stop. It's time for this to find a, a, a resolution. And they put forward some propositions, which, as Karen says, and anyone with a fair mind would say, are reasonable. A voice to the parliament, legislated by the parliament, and with powers and functions that the parliament determines and put it in the constitution where it would have a, it would just be an enabling uh, power for the parliament to use to set the voice up not a very big ask so whilst reconciliation can be conceived of as a process there has to be some terminuses there has to be some stops there has to be some achievements and karen pointed to the apology is one of those. The resolution of the voice to the parliament is one of those. The constitutional embedment is one of those. The Makarata Commission of truth telling and agreement making is one of those. So we, we as a nation have got far greater challenges internationally. And that's why this destruction of the Aboriginal sites in Western Australia and the propensity to, to litigate against the rights of First Nations peoples by the giant mining companies sends the message internationally that we as a nation don't care. We don't care what we do to the First Nations people. We can trample over them in the law and, and we can destroy their sites without any repercussions. You know? So this is a matter for all Australians. The First Nations people, you are now tarred with that identity as an Australian that gives the social license to international companies to further destroy and undercut and undermine the rights that First Nations people have achieved legitimately in the courts of this land. Now, these are, these are hard for a lot of people who don't follow uh, First Nations affairs on a daily basis. But if you come from a regime where you know the laws are not there to protect you, and that the laws are constantly being, my, being enacted to take away your rights, you soon get in a boat and move, or you take off and find another land. Now, these are the discussions that we have in common with many people from the, first, uh, from the uh, ethnic communities. And I think there's a lot of fertile ground in that to find a common ground, a common new polity, that can give expressions to our rich diversities so we aren't just caught and, and locked into one sort of uh, mono uh, cultural view of how the world ought to be. And we've seen that that world can easily collapse. The, the pandemic virus 
has put a serious hole into the way capitalists think. And, and, and I've never seen a, a, a Liberal government turn to be such a socialist entity with its subsidies to people. Uh, but, you know, that, that's how we should operate. We should look to the betterment of the collective, of all people, instead of just trying to promote the wealth of individuals at the expense of others. So there are many other lessons here to learn about our policy and about our relationship and certainly the resolution of those historical matters that continue to divide First Nations peoples from the colonial settlers of this nation. Well, we uh, had a question earlier about terminology, Karen. Uh, some of the reports I'm seeing um, are now describing this voice to parliament as a voice to government with no constitutional change. How do you interpret that kind of subtle repositioning? Well, I think it's, um, it's once again sort of downgrading and limiting what we've said before is, is a really reasonable uh, uh, request. I think it's really important and certainly uh, what we saw through some of our um, research is that the idea of taking this to the parliament and not to government to take some of the day-to-day -day party politics out of this is really important um, for this voice. And I think um, people understand, as, as Patrick said, it's about people having a say and it is about um, uh, doing this for the betterment of all people. This isn't about the party politics. This isn't about uh, one ideology against another. This is actually about how do we address, how do we grapple with, how do we engage with First Nations peoples in this country? How do we get better results that will then uh, in, uh, in turn then result in better results for all Australians? I mean, we're the fastest growing population and youngest population in this country. It's my nieces and nephews <laughs> and their taxes that are going to be supporting me in uh, older age. So how do we grapple with and make sure that they are uh, still able to be educated, that they are getting good jobs, that they are contributing and being part of a bigger society and the society that they are engaging with actually respects them and values them and their heritage and their culture in a real way and not just a lip service way. Okay, we, uh, Abraham Bradfield has been waiting for a while to put his question about mm -hmm. staying within the law but being more assertive. Can you put your question, please, Abraham? Sure. So um, in light of what's going on in America at the moment and sort of leaving aside the appropriateness of rioting or not, um, do you think that non-Indigenous Australians are sort of too passive and not engaged with um, Indigenous lived realities in order to have sort of an impassioned reaction to injustices. Who would like to take that? Well, I'll have a crack at it uh, first up, Anton, if you like. Look, in, in, the, in the parliament, there's a committee. Uh, oh, it's a, it's a cross-party committee, and it's there to look at any piece of legislation against the standards that have come from the United Nations covenants and declarations that we've signed up to. And, and it's meant to be nonpartisan. So we give advice to the minister about any shortfall where there's an infringement of the rights of uh, whether it's children, whether it's women, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's the First Nations peoples. So I, I would hope that far more Australians become conversant with the UN declarations and covenances. And when they deal with the politicians of this country, that they deal with them through that lens as much as they deal with them through their emotional uh, responses. Because then you have principle being applied to policy. And, and, and if the principles are, are based on these universal uh, mechanisms and declarations, then we will evolve a nation that has got principle rather than just operating on convenience. When it comes to responding to, um, to crises in this country, it, it is hard for most people to know what, what the situation is. And we'd like to be well-versed or well-briefed before we respond. But I think in general principle, we've had a Royal Commission into deaths and custody We've had inquiries into 
the uh, stolen generations, children being taken. We know enough about policies that are adverse to the interests of Aboriginal people. And we know about heritage protection deficiencies. So there's no real reason for us not to take stands when we see ongoing injustices, whether it's deaths in custody, whether it's the over incarceration of Aboriginal people, whether it's the series, there's nearly 3,000 Aboriginal kids in out of home care today. Now that's an indictment on this nation. Now we've got to do something about the systems and we've got to do something about the social situations of our families in order to reduce those rates and give those kids the opportunity of a real uh, life where they can enjoy the benefits of their culture and their social values. Otherwise, they're going to be, they're going to be the victims of yet another stolen generation uh, society. So non-Indigenous Australians can read these reports. They've got to understand the implications. This is happening today through the policies and the laws that are being made by governments that we vote for or people vote for. And they make the laws on your behalf. And you are as accountable as they are for the laws that are perpetrated upon First Nations people. Hence, why the people want a voice to the parliament. So they can say this law is going to adversely impact us. Because we know from the history of how you've treated us over the last 200 years. So at least give them the voice to the parliament if you can't find your own accommodations to respond in a positive way to the needs. Because it is, it, some of this stuff is complex. And that's why First Nations peoples are the right people to go to, to look after their own affairs in the first instance. But we can be very supportive by ourselves becoming knowledgeable about the history and about the treatment and about the ongoing nature of that as it impacts on their rights and interests in this country. Okay, we're rapidly running out of time. I think we might uh, take a few minutes on the other side of two o'clock, but I just wanted to bring Feka in uh, again with uh, the launch this week, uh, Shanua, of this um, From the Heart campaign, which is to reinvigorate interest in uh, and engagement with the reconciliation process. What kind of uh, resources do you think Feka can bring to this uh, campaign, I mean, bearing in mind that we're under severe COVID restrictions and uh, everything is fairly limited at this moment, but what kind of resources and support do you think FECA can bring to this conversation? Thank you for that question, Anton. I'm so glad you asked because just last week we did launch our guide encouraging engagement and I really encourage everyone um, in our chat to have a read of that as well. I can see there's a fantastic conversation going on there. So um, our guide really tries to address quite a few of um, the points that have been brought up today and also um, hopefully to address uh, Abraham's question as well. That responsibility, responsibility to educate ourselves on what is happening in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities does lie on us. We cannot always look to the other as being, you know, a resource and to be able to freely give up their time to educate us. We very much have that responsibility as well. Um, for people who are very new to this space, our guide talks about, you know, things from why we should have an acknowledgement to country at the start of meetings and things, but also um, talks about the stolen generation and dream time stories and what they are. So it's a really great starting point for people who might be very new to Australia, don't have that background, aren't even aware of, um, you know, like some of the points that Pat brought up about um, the disproportionate number of Aboriginal people uh, in incarceration, as well as young, um, young people and what's going on with them. Um, so if people do want to find out more information about all of that, please have a look at the guide. We also have some great links in there specific to each state and territory about who their um, local custodians are and where they can find more information um, more specific to them and their communities. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to squeeze in a couple more questions. We're going to take a question from Amna uh, while you're unmuting your mic there. Amna, I'm going to ask Karen, sorry, this is a fairly complicated question. Um, sorry to throw it at you right at the end now, but this, you know, we're living under COVID-19 and we have no idea yet of the ramifications of, 
what it's going to do to community life, to economic life, to mental health and so on. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have any sense of how much of a setback this is going to be to the reconciliation pro process and also the fact that government is now fully engaged in all of those issues. Is there a danger that quite legitimately people are going to say, well, do you know what, we've got to focus on this nuts and bolts stuff. We, it's nice to have something like reconciliation, but it cannot be our main focus now. Is that a, a problem, Karen? Yeah, thanks, Anton. Look, I think that's always a danger. Um, Indigenous affairs generally tends to get pushed to a sideline. Um, but what we say is actually this stuff is fundamental. It's fundamental to our discussions. It's fundamental to the polity of this country. And particularly with the pandemic and COVID-19, we saw um, those communities that are already the most vulnerable, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, being impacted uh, the most or potentially impacted the most. Um, the fact that we had to lock down communities uh, in remote areas because of the fear of actually all the other underlying health issues that happen in those communities and with our, um, uh, our ourselves, that that would actually have a devastating impact on us. Um, I think, so what this pandemic has actually shown is highlighted where those kind of inequities already exist. Um, and I would like to think that that should um, really boost or bolster us to be addressing those more regularly um, and that actually just um, pushes us that actually we need to do more. Uh, we need this not to be uh, a special thing because of Indigenous people. We don't have to lock down our communities because we are more vulnerable uh, than the rest of the community. Um, and I would like to think, and we certainly have seen that um, in lots of different ways with our Reconciliation Action Plan organisations and particularly those that had um, impact in supply chains, really pulling out stops of they've made these commitments to reconciliation. What does that look like in this pandemic crisis? Um, and how do we make sure that the things that they have committed to, the things that they think are important, don't get lost uh, in all of these uh, other actions that are equally as important? Oh my God. I'd also just like to, uh, just to note that uh, Professor Marsha Langton, Professor Tom Kalmer have been involved in an advisory capacity in this process. So I think those are very powerful voices and uh, that is quite encouraging. Uh, we have a question about how we address one another in these conversations. Amna, over to you. Hey, um, I had a quick question with the discussion that was going on about how migrant com communities can also help to be allies for the Indigenous um, groups. In what way specifically did you want to say, Amna? Just around more knowledge and awareness um, around it because I feel like as we're migrant communities ourselves, we don't really know how to go about supporting Indigenous communities. I think that's a very good uh, point. I know as a migrant myself, a newer Australian myself, I've been here 20 years. Um, the last thing you want to do is give offence, right? Yeah. And sometimes it, even when you go in with good intentions, mm. it is very easy to say, use the wrong term terminology, use the wrong word, uh, say something that you don't think is offensive, but that the next community might uh, well think that. Um, Karen, do you have any advice on how we can engage without causing offence? I think uh, education becomes the, the starting point of that. Uh, learning a little bit of history, learning the stories uh, and how we've gotten to where we are today and understanding, I guess, um, what's led up to the situations we find ourselves in. And, and I say that if you were going into any community and certainly when I'm traveling overseas, that's the kind of stuff that I, I look at. And then the same as we would say with uh, a non-Indigenous or with um, a more Anglo community is that to be an ally is about listening. It is about building those relationships. Uh, it is about deep listening. Uh, and as you build those relationships, one thing that happens time and time again is the generosity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, will be embracing. And if, if we feel and know that those um, attempts are genuine, then uh, there is an opportunity for us to grow from that. Okay, I'm going to give the last word to Shanua. Uh, just something you mentioned a little bit earlier about how we engage, uh, how we get non-Indigenous communities to engage with this process. Um, and in particular, 
does FECA have a, a, an opinion on how to engage younger and of course new Australians in the reconciliation process? Um, what do you think is the best way to encourage emerging migrant communities to understand the importance of this process of reconciliation? Um, yep, so uh, in our guide, we do talk about uh, strategies for engagement as well as opportunities for engagement. But I think the best way to go about it is very much like what Karen said, um, you know, begin that open, really inviting dialogue. We shouldn't wait for things like Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC Week to start paying attention. We have Harmony Day. That's very much, you know, a day for us to celebrate our culture. Why not invite our local um, Indigenous groups or local elders to those events, ask them to, you know, perform a welcome to country or even just begin that conversation and say, this is our culture. Um, you know, we invite you to come in and learn about our history and we would love to learn from you as well. Um, same with things like Eid festivals or uh, events around Independence Days. Why not make that first step and invite them, host them ourselves, uh, take some of that burden off. Um, we have a really great example from a community in Geelong, Victoria. Uh, we have a group of really new um, refugees from Myanmar who really took that first step. They could barely speak English, but they got in touch with their local, I think it's the Wathurong community there. They pretty much shared, um, the Wathurong community shared a lot of dream time stories, which is I think such a fantastic and underutilized resource by um, so many of us in this space where, um, you know, these dream time stories really encapsulate Aboriginal ties to the land. And once these very new recent refugees were learning about these stories and learning about how these billabongs and rivers came to be, um, they were able to gain that sense of connection themselves as well. And I don't think there's anything more powerful than being welcomed to a new country by the traditional owners of the land. Um, I know Dreamtime stories for me personally as well have been um, one of the ways I find connection to where I'm from. In the Blue Mountains, we have a really famous one about the Three Sisters. Um, we also have a section um, dedicated to just Dreamtime stories and learning about different ones uh, from your area in our guide. So I think that's a good way for people who are new to even the state or new to the country to have a read and learn about the land that you're on and learn about the history of the people as well. Thanks very much, Shamu. It's uh, certainly been a wonderful hour of discussion. I've certainly learned a few things about nuances and so on. Uh, I'd like to thank all our panelists today. Uh, just a reminder that a recording of today's discussion will be available online. And those of you who have uh, tuned into this uh, Zoom platform will be receiving a link to that recording. And we do encourage you to share it, share this conversation and continue the conversation yourselves with people around you. So thanks so much to Karen Mundine, Shano Shah and Senator Patrick Dodson for joining us today. And from me and my home in Redfern in Sydney, I'm going to say goodbye.